Welcome back live at Drew's House, another edition. Hope everybody is doing well. Hope everybody made it through the storm. It was a rough one here in Boston, a uh, rough one where my guest joins me from as well today. The great Linda Chorney joins us uh, from Lincoln Sudbury High School, outstanding musician uh, from New Jersey for a while, now lives out west, but is coming to us from New Jersey and was just in Newburyport. Did everybody follow that? Hello, Linda. That was good. Uh, I, I, did you lose the last one? <laughs> I did, yeah. You have to restart it. Oh no! You're hey, kidding me. You know what's funny about that, people? That we, that you don't it even was know. Was so good. We did a good ten minutes already, but we had to. to leave no, it. but the segue was great. Ooh, the segue was. My husband just tripped. Um, <laughs> the segue was great from Wahlberg into the thing. I didn't know you lost it because you had it recorded. We're gonna have to start again because I'm blabbing uh, about yeah. that. We won't fake it though. It's gotta be different. It can't be faked because. Oh, that stinks though. I know we didn't get your husband tripping. That's kind of funny. A funny moment. <laughs> Not for him. Okay. All right. Did, All right. We got did, started. How did oh. you do with the storm, by the way? Oh, uh, the perfect storm? <laughs> yeah, there you go with the Boston thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I hated that movie. Um, the accents were, were totally fake. Yeah, which gets into what we were, were, we did talk about this. We should, we don't want the people to miss out on that. We both hate fake Boston accents. Yeah. Like when they screw it up. Totally. Your favorite actor is, though, with the Boston accent? Uh, well, uh, Christian Bale did a great job in The Fighter. That's what we were talking about, how at least in, they didn't botch it up in other films. Right. But, and, of course, you know, Affleck and um, uh, Matt Damon do it right because they're from there. Right. Yeah. Affleck and J-Lo back together. You ever met them? No. No. Well, I you're haven't. like... Are they back together for sure? I think so. For now. This week. Uh, right. <laughs> the uh, so, Well, let's start there then. Let's do the Hollywood thing because you are like a big time filmmaker, I'm going to say these days. You're kind of doing it all. Tell us about the new uh, the new film. You're, you're a full-time musician, but also like filmmaker now. You got a lot going on. I, I, uh, I can't call myself, I guess I am a, a filmmaker, but I, I, I call myself a jackass of all trades because I do a little bit of everything. See, now I told you that before and you laugh and now you're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> We're doing this all over again, guys, because I had a freaking phone call that ruined our our last take. We love a good technical issue. Oh <laughs> so very good. Tell, oh. tell us about the film a little bit, though, just so people know. Okay. Um, I guess you could say I'm self-absorbed because I made a movie about myself. Uh, does that qualify What's can i get called? some can i get an award for having a film i made about myself it's called when i sing i'm an independent uh, musician and i had a story that i thought was worth telling because the truth is important and the truth gets twisted these days big time and so i wanted to make sure the truth was told about my story and it was a really good story it is a good story. For those of you who don't know, you are the first Grammy-nominated independent artist, correct? For America, Best Americana album. Best yeah. Americana album, um, big which is a big deal. What year was that? That was... 2012. <laughs> Way back in 2012 when I didn't have as many gray hairs. Now, yeah. you, you, you were ta we were talking beforehand about how you were uh, you, you, you know, expecting it to be your big break, and I, I sensed frustration from you. Did you expect that? To, did you want that to go in a different direction? Did you want to uh, be playing Gillette Stadium or something? Or it, what, what was? Yes. I, I actually thought that would happen after playing bars for... Um, I don't know, at that time, 30 years, and then finally getting my big break, uh, where they picked my music over some pretty big stars. They tried to twist it into that I somehow cheated to get nominated, which is impossible, uh, and uh, unless there's committees, which they just got rid of. That's a whole other story. Um, so, yeah, I will, you know, all artists want recognition for their work. And this was an album that spent a lot of time and, and energy on and money and great musicians. And I was pretty proud of the work and, and the, uh, the Grammy voters listened to it and they picked it. So for them to, you know, it's all about money. Everything's about money. So nobody profited off of my nomination and 
and uh, they tried to squash me. But you can't mess around with a 50-year-old woman going through menopause. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> the there you go. I actually don't know how to segue out of that one. No, uh, <laughs> that is hilarious. Um, so that, all right. So the Grammy experience, you know what? The Grammy thing though, like, I mean, obviously it's huge and uh, huge to be honored, but you don't really need that, right? It's, it's kind of cooler to, it's, you have the best of both worlds. You have like the independent, like strongness, you are, but then you were recognized for it. So it's like, kind of like, you're kind of that cool music that doesn't need to be the Grammy winner. I, I don't know, I like that vibe. Oh, well, thank you. Um, no, I mean, this year's Grammys, and I might get a lot of flack for this, I was embarrassed. I, I watched some of those acts, and I'm sorry, I am not a prude, but it was like pornographic noise a lot of the stuff that they showed on the show. And I, I was like, how is this being aired during prime time? And I, I just, I'm sorry, I, I got a problem with auto tune. I got a problem with, I got a problem with that phone call again. Hello. Oh no. This is the callback that was requested when. <laughs> okay, I just ended that. Now I'm just a little square again and I don't get to see your face. Drew, you do not have a face for radio, by the way. Oh, that's sweet of you to say. Yeah, I mean. Right back at you. Well, I'm not a radio person. <laughs> uh, okay, no. So, so anyway. Um, I like that you said that after I went away. Now you're just looking at a black screen. That's fantastic. No, I'm looking at myself. Okay. Hold on. Mad Mo, now you can see my dog. Oh, yeah, that's a dog. Hold on a second. Oh, this is good. The good boy. So. Oh, hello there. I know a good segue after menopause. I thought we had more. I thought I already did it. Never mind. Okay. We, no, after menopause, mm -hmm. then you have a pandemic, and what do you do? A postmenopausal puppy. Oh, there you go. This is a pandemic puppy. It is, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. And I was always on the road my whole life, so I could never have a dog. And he's the love of my life. And who? Oh, what's his name? Mad Mo. Adorable. Mad Moma Sugar is his full name, How and um, and he's named after a character in a television show I just produced called Saving Bernie. Which Bernie is Sanders. Party. Yeah, Bernie Sanders. Hello. <laughs> yeah, Bernie Sanders gets shrunken by a Russian mad scientist hired by the president because he was a threat, and uh, and then I I rescue him in a lair in Cambodia. And we get chased around the world in 12 countries. And I try to bring him back in time to win. And then the pandemic comes and we get stuck on a cruise ship. And then that's you my show. You don't want to be on a cruise ship in a pandemic. Yeah, well, in the show we were. And uh, <laughs> Can I get so one more? Win. What? Yeah, I was going to ask for that. Can I get one more Bernie accent? That's very good. Oh. Uh, I believe every American should be entitled for a cute little puppy. So, the revolution. The revolution. Yes, yes, it is. Anyway, okay. See, I, I do, I do Bernie's voice in the show. I'm looking at myself. I'd rather look at you, but it's not it. happening. You okay. All right, we're not going to screw this one up. You got it perfect. I, I, you're, you're, you're framed in nicely, and that hasn't changed at all. Uh, what I was okay. going to ask you um, is, uh, you have all these roots in in Boston and all that. Talk about, you know, my wife's running the Boston Marathon this year um, in October, which is different. And uh, you have quite the connection to that. The late Martin Richard, you were so good to that family. You wrote a beautiful song uh, to remind people of that because, uh, you know, we talked about that about 2013, I think, what the year was. But uh, it, it's a song that won't go away, and it led to a statue. Tell us all about that. Well, just like everybody else, I mean, we were all devastated. And I was living in Arizona at the time, and I live there now as well. And um, I went back east to uh, visit my family and pay tribute to, uh, to the, the tragedy by going to the makeshift memorial on Boylston Street. And I could not get the image of that beautiful little boy, Martin's face, holding up a sign saying, no more hurting people. It just blew my mind. and. I couldn't sleep and I woke up at five o'clock in the morning 
and wrote this song. Uh, I cried out the song, really. I could, I could barely get it out. And uh, I, I, I can't imagine, couldn't imagine at the time, but still can't imagine what that family was going through. And so I wrote the song and um, then I had my class reunion from Lincoln Sudbury and one of my classmates, uh, Jeff Davidson, has a school that he teaches little kids up in New Hampshire. And I hear, I heard little kids in this song, you know, in my producer mind. And I said, hey, do you think the kids would want to do something? And he goes, oh yeah, let me find out. And then boom, on a Sunday, this guy, uh, Tom uh, Peters, uh, Tom Holmes, sorry, Tom Holmes opened up his studio to us for nothing. I mean, everybody did everything for nothing uh, for the cause because in these sort of tragedies, 9-11, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, you want to try to do something to make a difference. And I'm sure little kids were struggling during that as well. So um, we recorded the song and then we, we made a music video and, and then uh, I thought there should be a statue for Martin in his memory holding up a sign, no more hurting people, because that's pretty prolific uh, and ironic. Um, and I had to present the song to the family out of respect for them. You know, I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person who thought of having a statue, but the, the, uh, sculptor, uh, Victoria Guerrera, who I, uh, I found through my friend, David Roth, who is a brilliant painter. Um, she made the prototype that I described to her and it was perfect. And then two years later, after we had already sent this information to the Richard family via their church, you know, out of respect for their privacy. Two years later, I got a call from, from um, Bill Richard and uh, he said they love the song, they love the statue and they love the painting. Uh, David Roth made a painting of, of their son and uh, that Bridgewater State was gonna fund the statue. Cause I, I had tried to raise funds with my download of the song Good luck getting people to buy <laughs> buy music. That's a whole other story. And uh, basically did not get nearly enough money even for a cloak for the, uh, for the statue, but Bridgewater huh. State funded it and it got done. That's, I mean, such a, obviously such a sad day, but one that's so close to Boston Marathon one day around here. And, and like I said, it's in October, which is different this year, but it must, you must be pretty proud to be a part of that and, you know, to build something like that, that will be there forever. Um, so make it's it a hard word. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, just go. go. That's it. That's all. Yeah. No, it's a hard word to describe because I don't know if proud is the word because you, it doesn't matter what we do because it's never going to bring back any of those people. Um, but I'd feel good about what I did. And, uh, and, and we accomplished stuff. But yeah, it's, it's a very hard word to describe what it feels like. But I'm glad, I'm glad we did it. But I'm not glad as to why I had to do it. Mm. I know you always, uh, the marathon's been changed forever. I know people, uh, people that are from here, like, like you, you, you remember it being around here. And uh, it's, it's a day that is always it just takes on a different feel now. It was big before, it's, it's different now. Yeah. I mean, I'll always, pardon my friend, I'll always be a mass hole. There you <laughs> That's go. That's who I am. And, and uh, so, yeah, I take, I take pride in being from Massachusetts. That's for sure. Um, and I love coming home and it was great coming home and it was great recording in Newburyport this week with the EJ at uh, Whole Music, EJ uh, Willette's Whole Music Studios. Big friend of the show. Here's one of the first, uh, when I launched the show, you know, a couple of years ago, this particular version of it, EJ was one of the first musical guests. What a talented guy he is. Oh yeah. He, uh, what a fiddle player, but he's also a great engineer. He's got really good ears and I met him through the Grammys and, uh, and we'd become friends and, uh, and musical creators together. And uh, he played bass. I, I wrote a new tune um, about the pandemic, and it's called Bored, because I was bored out of my mind. Yeah. I was so bored I bought a puppy, but that was the best thing that ever happened. But, uh, yeah, we wrote, I wrote this song called Bored. And then I reached out to him and said, hey, you want to play bass on this? You want to do something on this? And I played him the song. He goes, oh, yeah, let's do it. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah, he's usually down to try anything. That's uh, that's great. He's a good man. What was the what was the pandemic like? We, the pandemic was so hard on musicians. Like I I have musicians on here all the time, and some of them like found their little spot and did the streaming thing but most of them were like train wrecks if i ever have to stream another thing again i'm gonna go crazy i need that crowd coming back to me like what was it yeah. like well because i got into film i didn't miss it as much but uh well let me give you i'm just gonna give you the lyrics to the verse okay of board um, yeah okay um it goes uh i'm bored out of my mind uh i've had enough time to unwind uh kind of feel a bit confined but at least i'm feeling fine like you, you feel sorry for yourself because uh, you're bored, but at least you're not one of those people with a ventilator, right. right? So the verse goes, when I wake up in the morning, I'm breathing, but I'm wondering what to do. Look at the clock, look at the phone, turn on the news, look out my window at the view. Now I don't bother getting dressed because the only place I'm going is the living room. <laughs> but at least I am still living while so many in the world left us too soon. And then just goes, sending out healing vibes. It's just, it's a uh schizophrenic song yeah yeah i kept saying that to myself too but I, it's you have mixed feelings because i mean yes the people that are sick and at worst dying uh that's obviously the worst case scenario and then like just worse things that happen to people in general in life i kept trying to say that if this is the worst thing that ever happened to you you have to sit in and watch uh i love you we caught the eye roll pretty good behind the glasses that was good right there oh good excellent yeah. But That's I, a good song, the eye roll behind the glasses. That'd be a good song. There you go, sure. You, I saw that eye roll behind your glasses. It works for you. I think you should do it. It's, it's, take it. I'm good with it. <laughs> okay, well, well, you well, want partial, you get partial credit. No, I don't. That's, well, only. Yeah, yeah, no. If I scream it and I make like 48 cents, you can have <laughs> 4.8 cents. I get the impression you're not a huge like Spotify fan. The the devil, the whole thing, the whole thing has changed for musicians. I mean, the musicians you were just talking about who are complaining about being locked up at home. I mean, the only the only time you actually make money is doing live shows and selling your live product. Streaming, unless you're Taylor Swift or something, you're you're not going to make jack. Yeah. So. You know, you, I, I remember, I think it was probably after we talked the last time, but I remember going to check out some of your music. I think you had been... Am I right if I remember correctly? Were you on stage with like, I think you did a benefit with like Springsteen and stuff one night? Like you shared the stage with them or something? Like there was some benefit in New Jersey back in the day. Does that ring a bell? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's the Light of Day Foundation. Oh, you I'm, did Light of Day? Yeah, okay. Yeah, but I'm, hopefully, and that's a great, great organization. And um, hopefully I'll do it again this year. We'll see. But um, Do you still get that? Like when you talk about diving into film, you wrote a book, which has a great title, by the way. Who what was it? Who the hell is Linda Chorney? That was fantastic. Something like that. <laughs> That's, um, but do you still, when it comes down to it, though, do you still, is it, is it the live shows and like putting that music out there to a whole new group of people that really gets you going? Uh, yeah, if people are listening, anybody out there, this is from my movie, When I Sing. Um, this goes out to the 99% of us who are sitting in a corner of a bar wondering if anybody's listening, waiting to get their big break. <laughs> so it's all about people listening, especially if you're doing original music. You, as long as you get through to one person, if your music changes them, and what makes you feel good about yourself is when you, when you do something for others. So if your music touches someone, that's very fulfilling. Yeah. You know, I, I've actually, I actually got, uh, I've, been, I've been accused of, uh, by family members of being too conscious of this sometimes, but like if I'm ever at a brewery or something or whatever, and some, you have some musician like pouring their heart out into like these songs that you can, you know, they have written original music, like you said, I just can't stand when there's like that loud guy or girl in the corner screaming about the stupid, it drives me insane, like just yeah. shut up and go outside like i don't know it's like my huge pet peeve and people tell me that i take that too strongly but i'm like i don't know i guess maybe once you talk to musicians for years after years and see the struggle and what goes into these songs maybe yeah. it gives you a different perspective first of all there's a t-shirt out there that says you're listening to live music shut the f up that's pretty funny but oh i should get that I, i'm gonna tell you that for musicians who are listening to this this uh show uh drew uh, when I sing, 
which is on Amazon, not on Amazon Prime, which means you can't stream it for the money you're spending for Amazon. You have to actually buy it or rent it for five bucks. Uh, goes to the independent artist, which is a good thing, but it is the cheapest therapy session you'll ever have. As a musician, you will feel almost every single emotion that I go through in the movie. And so it's worth the five bucks to watch it because you'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, I feel like that. I feel like that. That's it. Wow. Okay. I'm going to have well, Kind of like you are with the live people. <laughs> but it's like, good. Might need like a drink for that or something. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, you should have a drink for every time I feel sorry for myself. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> kind of roller coaster. Okay. Okay. Wait, I was going to say something. I can't remember what it was. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So, uh, anyway, uh, I'm glad I did the movie. And uh, and now, uh, the last show I did was with Mike McDonald. I feel very fortunate to have shared the stage with a lot of really great musicians. And he was one of the nicest guys in the world. Yeah, you, you've played with, like, a who's, who's, like, the, who's the coolest? Who's, like, just down to earth. They're all pretty nice. Mike, Mike, I mean, he mentioned me in his set. He came on and well, he called me Linda Churney instead of Linda Chorney. A lot of people, uh, they, I've been called corny, horny. <laughs> uh, but uh, he's super nice. Bruce is very chill. Um, uh, Pat Benatar, I didn't get much of a chance to speak with her. Um, uh, Paul Simon was fun to talk to. Was he? I did him in Boston. I didn't do him in Boston. I played I played with him in Boston for oh my god, I want to mention this. Um my first manager was Fred Taylor. Um may he rest in peace, the icon who started Paul's Mall in the Jazz Workshop. And when Nelson Mandela was released from prison in 1980 I'm going to say I don't know, somewhere between 86 and 89, there was a giant concert on the hat shell. Yeah. And I wrote a song and they invited me to sing, which was pretty cool. So I played right before Paul, right before Paul Simon. Is that right? I had no idea that story. Oh uh, yeah, it, it's archived. But uh, wow. I was, uh, Paul Simon was supposed to go on and he was stuck in traffic. So I was stuffing my face backstage and they said, Linda, they want you to go on now. And so I, I, uh, I had to jump on when Paul was supposed to be on. No kidding. Yeah. Wow, that is an unbelievable story. I, it's funny because when they, uh, I guess when Mandela, a couple of years ago, there was some Mandela story in the news or Boston Connection, and they, they played a bunch of clips from that. And, uh, you know, I think, it was, I think it was 87, if I remember. I think it was the year I was born. Um, I think. And it, it's uh i was like wow that was an incredible event it's funny oh there we go uh, your dog's hearing my dog uh, oh wait you can't see that's right okay i'm gonna show the dog so now you can watch later where is he there he is okay oh, hello there you go. <laughs> i just put my dog inside we knew uh, we're, we knew we were gonna have a dog moment we, we said we got barking dogs so it was gonna happen by the time this was over that was awesome <gasps> yeah so yeah that was a uh, i got to meet nelson mandela too which was you did. yeah what was that like it was an honor for sure may he rest in peace yeah did he did he uh say anything that stuck with you what do you i don't even know what to ask when you meet nelson mandela i don't think i know anybody who's met nelson mandela i was gonna make a joke but i can't i just can't there's too many I, okay i'm gonna bitch about the cancel culture i think it's over the top Ooh, okay by the way i uh, yeah um no, he said to me, um, I was going to do something from the Dalai Lama from, um, from Caddyshack, but I'm not going to bother because it'll get all misconstrued and then I'll end up getting hate mail or something. Do it with the Bernie like Sanders that. voice and you'll be fine. <laughs> no, well, anyway, um, it, that was great. It was great. But the song I wrote in 10 languages, uh, which was what I was invited to play, there's a modulation in the song and I was hyperventilating cause I'd never played in front of 250,000 people. I was 26 years old oh or 27. And so when I went to modulate and not to sound, you know, full of myself, but I've got really good pitch. I overshot the note. 
in front of like 250,000 people. But they all had a good time anyway. But uh, that was the, I would say, the most embarrassing moment in my life musically to have over modulated. Really? To, uh, yeah. well, that is, I would imagine that's a tough thing. I, I don't know what the biggest crowd was you played before that, but that's a whole lot of people. Now, oh, okay. You know what my favorite gig was? My sure. favorite gig. Singing the national anthem at Fenway. Now that I would think would be very hard. And I nailed it. There you go. <laughs> it's in, it's in the movie. I guess I just spoiled the ending of the movie. That's the ending. But, After the roller coaster ride, that's how we end. Uh, sort of. Um, no, that's not how we end. But it's it's near there. That's just. I think because of my nomination, I got at least I got to sing at Fenway, and it was the hundred year anniversary uh, of uh, the Red Sox, and they played the Yankees. Oh, very cool! Big series. Yeah. Who do you root but, for? Are you still a Red Sox fan at Harder? Of course I am. Just making sure, just making sure. Um, yes. The uh, also a hundred years of uh, of my other station. For people to know, I'm a, a reporter at WBZ, and you just mentioned Paul Simon. I just heard it literally second Paul Simon discussion I've had today. My boss and I were talking about how uh, this guy Dick Summer, who used to host a show on WBZ, I remember. Yeah. Like, like apparently the story goes that like he started playing Paul Simon uh, records and just was like really pushing Paul Simon and like everybody, he like, he wasn't going to make it unless he started, unless this guy started playing it in Boston and because of Dick Summer, it started getting a lot of time in Boston and eventually Paul Simon goes on to become Paul Simon. But I guess it was kind of a Boston was his launching pad in a lot of ways. Into I'm sure he played at Paul's mall in the jazz workshop, Fred Taylor's place too. I'm Definitely. Sure. And speaking of WBZ, I want to give it a shout, a shout out to Jordan Rich. There you go. Who, who um, it was does the trailer voice for When I Sing. And uh, he also does this character named Jack in Saving Bernie, which will be back up online soon. I took it down temporarily. All right. Very good. So you told me who the foolest people were. Who's the worst in rock and roll? Who, do, who can't you stand? Myself. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, I can't stand... Anybody who creates auto-tune, the person yeah. who created auto-tune should be shot. Are you worried? How's that? Are you worried about the music industry with the, uh, I get the sense you are after your Grammy comments because that's like, uh, I don't know. I am it? so worried about the ears of the future because they're mm. being brainwashed with such garbage. You know, I, I, I just grew up with the best music in the world. I mean, I'm a classic rock fanatic, you know, there's, I mean, actually Greta Van Fleet is pretty good. You know, they, they're a lot like Zep, but, um, yeah. you know, the Almond Brothers, my very first concert was uh, Muddy Waters opening for the Almond Brothers at the Boston Garden. <laughs> and, uh, there, you know, Steely Dan, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, oh, Charlie Watts, may he rest in peace. Oh, I know. That was like, I was on vacation just last week when he passed away, and I was like, I didn't know he was sick. I, I mean, where, yeah. it was surprising to me. He was, I met him backstage because uh, my album, Emotional Jukebox, the one that got nominated for the Grammy, I had Lisa Fisher, who toured with the Rolling Stones for 18 years, she did uh, backup vocals on my album and she's just she's an instrument herself she's an instrument like no other and that's how i met charlie and uh and ronnie um uh mick and uh keith stay when you're backstage like at the madison square garden that's where i was <clears throat> they don't fraternize backstage even they they go in their own room so but i got to meet charlie and uh and ron Oh, that's cool. Yeah, he uh, he, he was he was unbelievable. So many. It's funny to you can always tell how well liked. There's my dog in the background. You're gonna like that when you watch this back. Real good appearance from the dog. Uh, <laughs> breaking up a good uh, passing away story, but all those almost everybody came out and spoke glowingly about Charlie Watts. You can always tell how well liked the guy is when fellow musicians just come out and pour their souls out like that. He's a gentleman. Ah. You know that's what's that's that's what's so lovely. Uh, uh, about him. Um, is the story true that he punched Mick? Have you heard that story? I have not. Mick was like drunk one night in a hotel and uh, was, I think he was messing around with a song or so, something and called him at some crazy hour and said, hey, where's my drummer? I need my drummer up here. And uh, 
Watts goes up to the hotel room. Mick opens the door and he punches him. And he says, uh, "I uh, it was something about how did uh, I'm screwing up the line." He says, uh, "Don't ever call me that again. You're my singer." And left. <laughs> You're my singer. Yeah, I that's was, great. I guess they, they they had some. I think they were good the next hour, but uh, but yeah, great. It's one of my favorite Rolling Stones story. I hope it's true. But b- back to to the. Uh, you know, classic rock and real music, organic instruments, singers with expression, this auto tune and this, this style of auto tune, really, I'm, they should line them up and shoot them. It's, just, it's awful. I, I don't mean with guns, like with like, yeah. you know, Nerf balls. Yeah. Nerf with, balls. Like, with career ending Nerf balls is what you're saying. Career ending Nerf balls. That yeah. you, you, Drew, that's Too another cool. brilliant thing. Yeah. That's two brilliant things you've said. Yeah, what was the first one? It would be uh, sunglasses. Uh, Eye, eyeball roll, yeah. Eyeball roll, yeah. Um, so to, to go from that to this stuff, I mean, there's still a lot of great music out there. The problem is that music is not being heard because the labels have a lot of power. I don't know who the heck are running these labels and making the decision, decisions, I like the decisions that. on who they sign. Yeah. But you know, what, what is pop now? Like, for example, I just put my song Bored, which I did with EJ and Trevor Sewell from England. And speaking of which, you know, Zoom, uh, the good thing about what came out of COVID is uh, that Zoom is, uh, it's easier. Like I did sessions uh, I, overseas while I was home and people maybe didn't think of that before as much. But anyway, um, what was I talking about? Oh yeah, I brought I put my song in and I wasn't sure what category to put it in. I would think it's it's rock or pop, but these days pop is something else. Yeah. So, no, I hear you. It's funny, you know, a lot of these independent you're right, there is a lot of good music out there still. That and there are great bands and great musicians and not getting played on the radio. Um but it's right. there it's funny. I do feel like there's like this like kind of brewing culture where like people are like kind of those independent artists, they're like really starting to gain some, especially right before the pandemic, which is why it just sucks for so many up and coming artists that were really gaining traction that this happened. But there was kind of this movement to like just get out there and see live music. And I hope it picks back up after the pandemic because there are great bands still out there. Just you're not going to hear them on your drive to work. I miss you. There's a new band called the Honey Sticks. Oh. Honey Sticks that my cousin's actually the bass player in LA and they got signed with Warner and they're they're going around the world now, I think. But and they're really good. Um Are you gonna tour again? I don't know. I got my puppy. I just, I, I'll take him with me. I actually did a gig and put him on stage with me. That's oh well that you can do that. That's fine. Yeah. You can't you can't you can't let a dog see that would be a bad bad thing from the dog if it makes you stop touring. They we need you out there. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. To, I was thinking of putting a band together again. You know, my first band was in Boston. And what happened was, I, I mean, I played all the bars. I played the Channel and yeah. Fun Ratties and the Rat Skeller and uh, Zoots. I, these places don't even exist anymore. And uh, I started losing my high-end hearing. Oh, and in fact, there's a guy in Newburyport. Um he owned a place called the Sit and Bull mm. in Maynard, and he opened up a restaurant in Newburyport. I'm uh, drawing a blank <laughs> of his name. But anyway, I started losing my high-end hearing from having that bass amp and that snare going bap, bap, bap right behind you. And then you get the guitar player who turns up, and this one turns up, and that one turns up. And then you can't even hear yourself. And to me, the most important thing is hearing the singer. and and the lyrics and uh and the other things should just hug that and so that's the hard part about having a band unless you have a giant budget and a great sound team around you so i like playing solo and duo okay love that uh you're gonna be a great rapid fire candidate i know we're gonna get you out of here um you're traveling today right you said uh no i just have things to do before i go to iceland (laughs) i'm going to iceland Oh, that's ice. Yes. Excellent. That's a uh, third time you said? Third time's a charm. Yeah. Should be good. Uh, again, Linda Torney. Okay. Rapid fire. Ready? First thing that oh, comes okay. to your mind. For, for just a minute of this. First thing that comes to your mind. Favorite venue you ever played? 
Fenwick. Okay, good one. Boston answer. That was not rapid, though. That was bad. Yeah, it's not bad. You'd be surprised how people struggle with this. Um, the who, We talked about the coolest people. Who was, like, the funniest artist you've ever, the big name artist that we've ever, you probably wouldn't think was funny? Like, who's the funniest? Made you laugh. Good conversations. Me. <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that many that were funny. Um, I mean, I, I like to do funny on stage. Oh, John Eddie's pretty funny. Okay. You know him. John yep. Eddie. Good one. Favorite city outside of uh, one that you've lived in? What's your favorite uh, visiting place? In the United States or? Around the world. Oh, uh, that's hard. Rome. Rome. Like it. Favorite TV show? Not yours. Curb Your Enthusiasm. Like that one. Favorite movie of all time? Planet of the Apes. Favorite concert? And, Har and Harold and Maude. Okay. Favorite concert you've ever seen? Well, that's hard. And the Almond Brothers, any Almond Brothers show. First any Almond Brothers show. First, first album you ever got? Meet the Beatles. Meet the Beatles. Yeah, that's not the first time we got that answer. All right. And how did you like Newburyport? That'll be the final one. Let's end there. Do you, do you enjoy your time here? Oh, Newburyport's beautiful. Ted. Ted is the guy who owns the place in Newburyport, who owned the bar. Nice. Good dig out of you. Rapid. That's <laughs> rapid. Ten minutes later. You enjoy um, rapid fire. That's good. Yeah. Rapid delayed fire. Rapid. Um, that, could be the name of, that could be the name of the album. Rapid delayed fire. Yeah. You yeah. don't like it as much. That's fine. Now, that's not as brilliant as some of your other stuff. <laughs> think is something but uh yeah Newburyport is is but you know I didn't have time we were in the studio EJ Willette and I were the entire time mixing uh this week last time I was in Newburyport um I I did a show at the fire station you know that place mm -hmm. there and uh and we showed my movie there and we got time to walk around and go to go to the beach so it's beautiful cool well, I personally think you are uh, fantastic. I enjoyed uh, listening to a lot of your stuff after we spoke to, uh, back in 2013, and this was kind of a nice little uh, thing to see you come back around. It was accidental. I didn't know you even knew EJ. I, uh, I happened to see him post a Facebook picture, and I said, Linda! Oh, that's how that worked? Okay. Yes. Well, I appreciate you reaching out to me. And um, for those of you guys out in the audience, we had done, like, almost the entire show, and it was really good and spontaneous. And then I had a call come in from American Airlines, and it cut us off. Yeah. So we had to start all over again. Do you think the first one could have been better? The second one was just different, I think. I'm not necessarily sure better. Yeah, I don't know. You like that's that? A hard, that's a hard one. It's like picking the, the best city. What's your <laughs> favorite? What's your favorite city? Uh, you know what's funny? I it. Tick tock. Tick tock. Rapid fire. I'm, I'll be simple. It's New York City. I love New York City. I tell my wife, it's like the place that I just love to go visit. And uh, I could never live there, but I love visiting there. I love, I've, I've lived in New York. It's the best. Yeah, it's a boring answer for you. No, it's not. Yeah. But, but New York is, is the greatest city in the world, yeah. period. But, you know, you can't, well, you can get good pasta too. Go Yankees. <laughs> oh, my husband's a Yankee fan. Oh, he is? How does that work? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> It's fun. We just bust each other's chops. Yeah. It's a good year for that. What's that? It's a good year for that. It's been a roller coaster for both teams. They both suck. Kind of. It would be great if, like, the Sox could stop getting COVID. I think that would be better. Oh, is that what happened? By the way, I want to make a statement about this Red Sox nation. Uh-oh. So I grew up in a time where the Sox just sucked all right. the time. 67, they had a break. 75 was great with uh, Carlton Fisk and Fred Lynn and Jim Rice. And, you know, the impossible dream and, uh, and Yaz. Uh, and then they, you know, they always choke. They always choke. Yeah. Buck Mir may he rest in peace. And, but we loved them. It didn't matter. We loved them, even though they choked and they lost. We were with them all the time. And it was always fun going to a game. And it was great going to the bleachers when they were three bucks a seat. Yeah. And 
now, you know, they won all these games many years. So these millennials, oh, yeah, Red Sox Nation, we're the best. We win all the time. You know, it's like you have to love them when they suck, too. Otherwise, you're not a Sox fan, and you're not worthy of being a Sox fan. Yeah, although what I will say is you uh, – I, I think you're kind of directing this. Like, I am technically a millennial, so I take offense to that a little bit. You so, should. No, I <laughs> – I earned, I always tell, I tell my cousins, like I have that same speech with my younger cousins who don't, they didn't have to like earn their stripes like that. Like I watched Aaron Boone hit that horrible home run. You can let your husband hear that. That like broke my heart. And my grandfather was like, I'll never see him win. And uh, you know, all that stuff. Like I, I earned my stripes that way. See people, I do think people are throwing around that millennials line a little too easy these days. It's like millennials are married with kids. I'm not, but well, I'm married, but I don't have kids, but you know, they're married kids and very, productive people most of them i'm taking on the next generation who's this younger that that's who we're attacking yeah well listen ej came up with a line yeah we were in the studio the other day and so he was having some conversation with somebody about somebody else and he goes don't let millennials push you around (laughs) i said that's a song so anyway um you have three songs for the album there you go yeah of you yeah 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 so far uh and it, it was real pleasure speaking with you even though i had to look at myself the whole time i know sorry that happened you can blame american airlines <laughs> that's good you should, you should um, watch it back though i think you'll be impressed with how show number two came out uh, okay uh, is it going to be are you going to edit i hope it's this long it's this we, long yeah but please, yeah well you want to say goodbye to mad mouth mad mouth say goodbye to everybody come Thank here you, oh, come yeah. here Judy. Oh, do you, oh, he wants me to throw the ball. He's got go. the ball. We're going to do it. We're going to have both dogs in the picture here as soon as you get. Okay, hold on. Hold on a second. Mad Mo. It's going to happen. Mad Mo. Can you see him? No, uh, no. Look it. Oh, yeah, there he is. Oh, yeah, good ball. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Now, this okay. Is a, this is a good way to end. Linda, thank you. Thank the dogs. Pleasure as always. Drew, we'll have to meet, meet each other next time. And Absolutely. thank you so much for having me. Mad Mo, she go by. Okay. This See you fun. later. <laughs> go saw. 30 seconds of bonus coverage with Linda Chorney. What did you just say? Now I can see you. I don't know what you hit, but I can see you now. I have a feeling this was more of a you thing. Oh, definitely, because only millennials, only millennials how to use Zoom. I'm an old fart. <laughs> I hate Zoom. I don't want to ever use it again. No, I like really? it. It's a fine product. I don't know. I just, I miss the studio. Like, I usually I have people play music for me, and I have, like, the most spoiled thing in the world. I have full bands come on. They play five songs. I don't have to do anything. Mm-hmm. You know. Oh. I just went into the studio to to visit Jordan, Jr. You know, mm-hmm. Jordan Rich from, and uh, and Mad Mo came and pooped all over his. Oh, nice! Yeah, it's well played. Oh, so you missed that. Yeah, I, I guess. <laughs> Do you call him Jr.? No, I call him Jordan. Okay, me too. I've never heard anybody call him Jr. Was yeah, that- Jr. I don't know. Yeah, you'll have to ask him this. What's behind that? But he's he's funny. Oh yeah, he's a funny guy. He's great. He has great impressions too. Great impressions, really great voiceovers. He's a he's a he's a very funny man. You're very right about. He's also that. a really nice man. Very nice man. Yeah, and and so are you, Drew. Uh, Glad to see you. To say, oh, can I see your dog now? Oh yeah, we can do that again, Mookie. Oh, actually, where is he, Mookie? Come here. Sometimes he hops up in the. Come here. Come here. He um he escaped last night from the backyard <gasps> with his brother. Here he is. With bad weather coming. Look at that guy. Hi there. Mookie. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello. You are so beautiful. Gets I'm going to meet him next time. Yeah, actually, I think we, is Henry over there? No, Henry's, I got another one too. He's running around somewhere. Okay. I've lost nice control. Hey, by the way, I wore sunglasses, Mr. <laughs> Millennial, because I was too lazy to put eye makeup on this morning and, you know. But you looked, couldn't hide the eye roll. I could not hide the eye roll, <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> Even with makeup. Bye. Bye, Linda. That was fun. Hope you all enjoyed that. Linda Chorney, outstanding artist. Um, 
joked about being being a filmmaker, but she actually has put together some very cool films. Go buy that if you have a chance. Um, Why I Sing, she uh, talked all about it there, and uh, it seems like a fun little roller coaster ride. I think I'll watch that here soon. Um, but the reason why I know her is because she's a great musical artist. And I really got into some of her stuff when uh, when I interviewed her back after the Martin Richards song was written, and I thought that was a really cool thing she did. So I started digging into some of her other stuff, and she like she's downplaying it. She played with all these great artists, and uh, you heard some of the stories there. But some of her stuff you can just watch it on YouTube or whatever, and uh, maybe you'll get into some of her music. But she's pretty great, so check her out, Linda Chorney. Uh, my name is Drew Mulholland. Live at Drew's house, another edition. Hope everybody's doing all right. We made it through the remnants of Ida. Uh, that was a tough night, but I uh, hope you're all having a good day. And uh, good, hope you all had a good week. Thursday already. We're already to the weekend. We'll see you next week. Live at Drew's house. Peace.